All right, guys, welcome back to the show. Today we're going to do, be doing a footing job. For those of you who've been around, um, we've done a lot of these, but today we're going to break this footing job down into a quick step by step process plus uh, the tools and costs that it takes to do a pier. So we'll uh, talk about what the concrete costs per pier, what the sound tube, bracket, all that kind of good stuff. Um, but before we get started, if you guys are interested in designing a barn and minium, or post frame building shop, reach out to us, design at Mr. Post Frame, we can help you out. Also for you self builders, we have a Patreon group that's designated just for you guys. It's a group where we do lives every month. You get to ask me questions. It's a great community of other self builders. You get to share your journey. You get to talk to other people who are sharing the things that they wish they would have done different. It's a great, um, if you want to self build, check it out. Um, but let's go ahead and get into the process. First step is going to be laying out uh, the corners of your building. The one we're doing right now is 40 by 72. Um, I'm doing this by myself, so I am going to set my string lines um, an inch and a half in on each side. It just saves me a little bit of time when I'm setting piers and everything. So I'm going to set lay this out as a 39 foot 9 inch by 71 foot by 9 inch. Uh, building and that's so my string lines are going to be right along the edge of my bracket when I set them So to get started, you're going to need a couple tape measures. I only need hundred footers on this job um, That's going to be good for most cases um, Quick tip if you're going to buy some tape measures Try to buy ones that have a metal tape and the reason being is if you get like nylon or plastic they can stretch so metal tapes are definitely preferable because they do not stretch. So that's one thing you're gonna need. Um, you're gonna need some orange marking paint, and then you're gonna need some long nails, or these are some old um, structural legs that I use to drive in uh, to find my points. So um, that's really what you need to get started in laying out. I do have a construction calculator to get my diagonal. So you use a Pythagorean theorem to do that. Uh, my diagonal in this case for what I need is 82 feet, 516. So step one is I set the front of my building. That's my given. I know which way I want my building to be facing, where I want it, and then I build off that. So I've got that done. I then take two tape measures off each pin. I put a pin at each end, and then I pull a tape. I pull my diagonal and my short side, and I mash those up, drive another stake. And then I get that point, and then I do it in the opposite corner. And that gives me a pretty darn good um, point to start putting up my batter boards, which is part two. So I'm going to go ahead and get my batter board set. So for that, you'll need, I like to do two at 90 degrees. Some guys like to do one long one at an angle. I like to do the two at 90 because a lot of times I'm doing this by myself. So I can hook a board on there. And pull the tape by myself. I can show you that when I get to that point, but let's go ahead and get all our batter boards set. All right, guys, so if you're gonna be doing this yourself for this um, phase right here, as long as you have your pad level, you really aren't gonna need your grade stick to set your string lines. However, I will set all my batter boards um, with my uh, laser just so I know they're all perfectly level, um, but that's not necessary if your pads are gonna be close enough. Um, that you'd be all right. However, when you're setting your tubes and stuff like that, um, it will be really helpful to have this. And if you're going to self-build um, anyway, this is a tool that you're going to need to buy. Um, there's lots of different ones out there. This is the Stabila LAR 350. We have a video on this. Um, costs about $1,800, $2,000. Uh, it's a very high quality one. If you 
are like, man, that's a lot of money. This is a tool that you could buy, use, and then resell pretty easily. Uh, so it's one of those tools that you need and then will make your life a lot easier through the entire build process. But it is necessary to have some kind of a laser uh, for this unless you just want to use a string line level and set all of your tubes off of that string line. That is um, possible. So we're gonna go ahead and get these stakes in, get going. Set my boards. I just wanna make sure that I set this board back far enough that I have room for my auger to get in there. That's all you really need. Um, so that looks good to me. I know I'm gonna be able to hit that line over there. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my stakes in right here. Gotta go get stakes. Another thing you're going to need is a drill, which most of you should probably um, already have. If you buy a 2x4, 8 foot long, cut it in half, that's going to be good for one corner of your building. Whether you run it diagonally or you do it like I do, cut it in half and do like a 90 degree, that one 8 foot board will cover one corner. So if you just have a rectangle building, you need four of those to cover each corner for your batter boards. That's pretty sturdy. Yeah. Save me a stake, Justin. Um, the other thing that is really, really helpful is metal stakes with screw holes in them. Uh, they're concrete form stakes. You can buy them at Menards, Home Depot, Lowe's, and they usually run about uh, eight, nine bucks a piece. Um, I use three to four at each corner of the building. So, I mean, you can do the math. Three on each corner of a building, that's 12. So 12 times eight is 96. So you're looking at around 100, 100 bucks. And they come in really handy for all kinds of things. Um, so it's well worth the investment versus making wood stakes that are hard to drive into the ground. They're hard to get really stable. Um, so that's another thing that you probably should invest in. All right, so I have my four corners set for the main building. And now what I need to do is I need to run my string lines over these pins that I set in the ground. Um, and that will get me really close. Once I get those set like that, uh, I will fine tune them to get them perfect based off my diagonal and all that kind of good stuff. So this works really good with two people. If not, it might take you a couple trips back and forth just to get it lined up. I'm just gonna hook that there. So this string line I will not be moving because this is where I want the front of the building. So I'm over the top of this pin here. I'm gonna go check that one, move it if I need to. And then I'll do the opposite side wall. And then I'll measure from this string line to that string line and make sure it's 39 feet, nine inches, both here and at the other end. And then those will be perfectly parallel to each other. All right, so I'm straight over the top. Of this one, I had to move it a few inches, so I'm gonna go back and check to make sure that one uh, didn't move off. Do the other side. I'm off to a great start. Parallel to each other today. All right, so if you're doing this by yourself, can be quite difficult to pull tape. So this is why I do 90. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a board in here and then I can put a screw that is exactly two feet or two feet one and a half off that line so I can pull eight foot all the way across uh, here by myself. All right, so let me explain this to you. So since this string line is the edge of my columns, I have an inch and a half girt out here. So that's why I'm going two foot, one and a half, because I want this even mark where the actually outside edge of my building is. And so now I can pull eight foot on center all the way across. So if I go over to that other string line, it should read 
let's see, it should read 41, 10 and a half, I believe, if my math is right. Oh dang, Justin, look at that. 41, 10 and a half. So I'm, I mean, I probably could move it out about an eighth, which I will, because I want this to be perfect. Make sure I pull that out right away. All right, so we're 41, 10 and a half. So now, We'll go down to that side and make sure these string lines are perfectly parallel and then we'll work on our two end walls. Boom. This one, I gotta move. Quarter, it looks like. this one out. All right, so our two side walls are perfectly parallel to each other. So now um, I'll start, put a string line across one end over my pins, and then we'll run our diagonals and our long measurement, make sure they meet and get these ends set. So I need to move one of them about an eighth. Might as well move this one since I'm here. And then this will be perfect and then we can Be seventy three ten and a half. Seventy three ten and a half. Let's take this out. All right, so now I know this corner here and that corner down there are the right distance apart. I just made sure this corner and that current corner were perfect. So here's the thing. We're the same distance from this corner to that corner and also that corner to that corner, but the building might not be squared. It could be like this a little bit or like this. Um, so we just have to pull our diagonal to make sure. You good? I gotta move this just a hair. Good? All right, we're good that way. Right there. All right. 
I'll just double check my long measurements and we'll be good. Boom. Well, that's still good. Just gonna check the other one quick and then mark all our pier. Boom. All right guys, so we have this all marked out. Um, we've squared it up. We're good to go. So now it's time to go ahead and pull all of our dimensions, mark where our holes are gonna be. So I'll do that. And then I take just a piece of sound tube, set it over, imagine my post being in the middle and mark it. That way when I come up with my auger, I just have to center my auger in there and I'm gonna be close. And I get a lot of questions, comments about if somebody sees that a column is off centered, that's all right. It has to be full bearing on the pier, so it can't be hanging off, but as long as it's full bearing and your rebar on your bracket has two inches of coverage, you're good to go. And if you're asking yourself, well, how come they're all not perfectly centered? If you hit a little rock or something like that, it'll bump your auger over and it's easy to get off uh, two inches one way or the other. But we're gonna go ahead and mark all of our dimensions and mark our holes. On our plans, we have what we call running dimensions. So we have marks that shows the columns are eight foot on center, but then we have a running dimension line. So all you have to do is look at your plans. It'll say eight, 16, 24. And that seems pretty simple, except for when you get to garage doors where it might, the next one might be six feet from the last column. It'll say 30 feet, one and a half inches. So. Uh, we'll show you that on the plan so you kind of understand it, but that really helps when you're pulling these versus doing a bunch of math manually. 18. drilling holes and one thing you guys are going to have to have is a skid steer and an auger or some kind of tractor and auger. A skid steer is going to work a lot more efficiently. If you don't own one, you can rent a skid steer, at least in my location here in the Midwest, for around $250 for a day. And then an auger, an auger drive is going to cost you about another $200, $250. So for about $500, bucks, you can rent a skid steer and auger for a day and you should be able to drill all those holes in one day, especially if you lay it out, mark it out one day, line up your skid steer and drill for the uh, next day. You should have no problem doing that in one day, so it costs you about 500 bucks if you don't own a skid steer and an auger. The size of auger I use, I, have, I use an 18 inch auger, and that gives me between an 18 and 20 inch round pier. Um, I go 54 inches deep here. Our frost line is 24 in, or 42 inches. I go 54 inches, and I've done this all the way up to 72 foot wide buildings, and have had zero problems with uh, the piers being able to support that amount of weight. Now, if you get into certain areas around cities, um, they're going to require engineering, and an engineer is going to uh, spec these probably somewhere between. 24 and 36 inches um, based on their mathematic calculations. So you're just gonna have to check with local code um, what they require where you're at. I have some areas where they don't even want you to build a barnuminium on piers because they don't understand how you do frost protection. They don't understand how you support the uh, upper walls if it's a two-story. So it's gonna vary depending on your location. All right, all the holes are dug. Feel a little motion sickness right now, back and forth. Um, I cut these sound tubes down to about 14, 15 inches. If you buy these, it's going to cost you 15 to 16 dollars a foot. Um, these are 20 inch um, sound tubes, so we actually cut them down the side so they collapse inside of each other, and then we will stick it down in the hole. Um, another option for you is you can find a metal supplier. Um, a lot of times they'll give you their tubes for free and you can cut those down. Um, a lot of times I just run out of time to go get them. So about 16 bucks a foot. Put it inside the hole like so. Let it expand back out. Take a couple screws. Just 
just to secure it like like that. Then I set it to where I to grade with my laser, and then I'll push this in around. So I'll get my laser set up, and uh, we'll get rolling. So I shoot for I shoot to be within a quarter inch of my zero, um, and that's all you really need to be. Quarter, eighth, once you get it where you want it, you're just going to push this stuff in around the side like this. And that is ready. concrete. I just got to do that uh, 43 more times. One of the biggest challenges you're going to have depending on your property is how do you get the concrete to the holes. I have a skid steer and a concrete bucket and it works amazing. Uh, we live in south central Iowa, it's really hilly um, and so for me to get a concrete truck around is really difficult and it just is so much less stressful to have that concrete bucket to get concrete to my holes. If you don't have that, you have two options. One, you can make sure your site is prepared where you can get a concrete truck in there to back around your building. Uh, my house, if you look around the outside of my house, it's really hilly, and I poured all of that out of the back of a concrete truck. So we had to maneuver the concrete truck around, and we were able to get it done. I did my house in three pours um, just because it was a little bit more time-consuming getting that truck in and around. Um, so you can do it. Your other option is to get a pump truck, but that's pretty costly. That's about a 1000 bucks just to get a pump truck. And if you're not a concrete contractor, it's pretty tough to do. So... Got to make sure um, you can get that concrete truck around. They have a 17, usually they're somewhere between 15 and 17 feet. They can take their uh, chute out. So you can actually get quite a ways away from your hole to get your uh, holes filled. Um, so I just want to talk about that a little bit. I have had some people that have bought a concrete bucket. It's one of those things that you probably could buy. Um, they're a few thousand bucks and then you could resell or you could rent it out. Probably not the best option if you're going to build just one building but um, it is an option. 18, with an 18 inch auger, 54 inches deep, we use a third of concrete per hole. Um, the holes usually end up a little bit deeper just because your form kind of sits up a little bit. Um, so you can easily figure every three holes you're gonna need one yard of concrete. Um, so you just take the number of uh, piers you have, divide it by three, and that's gonna get you close if you're getting it out of a concrete truck. Um, you're gonna, you know, you wanna order maybe a half yard to a yard extra. Um, we have the on-site mix truck, so I pay for what I use, which that's really nice, um, but most of you aren't going to have access to that, so keep that in mind. One yard of concrete for three holes with an 18-inch auger, 54 inches deep. one and a half. So now add two feet to every eight. Ten. Eighteen. Ten and a half. Boom. I like it. Love it when it works out perfect. One other thing that you need is string lines. 
Um, that's how you uh, know where to set your brackets down along that line. So you, your string lines are going to go from batter board to batter board, and that's going to give you a nice straight line. It's going to give you something to take a black marker and mark the center of your brackets on. I will forewarn you, when you put your string line up and you mark it with your black marker, do not take it down. If you take it down, you're going to have to remeasure because when you pull that string line tight um, and mark it and then you take it uh, down, it contracts. So that mark is not going to be in the exact same spot as it was where you originally marked it. So just keep that in mind. Um, if you have to take your string line down. All right guys, so we're gonna talk about the most commonly used brackets, at least for us, and that's the SWP-63, SWP-64, SWP-66, and our dry set uh, universal for the garage door opening. So this is a SWP-63, so this is for a two by six, three ply column. So that means two by sixes, three of them are laminated together, and they fit inside here. So um, they make this in a few different variations depending on whether you're using glue lambs, nail lambs, all that kind of stuff. So you just got to specify that. We use three ply columns up to 14 feet. So 14 feet and under, we'll, we use three ply columns. And then when we get to 16 feet sidewall, we go to the SWP 64, which is a two by six, four ply. Uh, column bracket. So anything 16 feet and higher, we use a four ply. And you can see uh, the size difference in these brackets. Um, it's quite substantial. So that's kind of how we determine what size bracket we use. And for most cases, that will work for you unless you have some special building that, you know, is kind of out of the ordinary. The other bracket that we use is the SWP 66. So this is for a six by six post. And we use these on all of our porch uh, porch posts. So um, I like to use a, a nice heavy duty bracket for my porch posts. If you think about your building, uh, your porch is open, you're gonna get a lot of uh, wind uh, pushing up on your ceiling in there. So this is probably overkill, but I think it works out really well. Um, we got videos on how we set these so they're above your concrete. So if you ever have to switch out a post, uh, you just got to pull your screws, bolts, and you can take your post out and put a new one in. And then the last one we use, the SW60, which is a uh, dry set uh, universal bracket. And these are meant to be used in corners or in garage door openings. I use these on our garage door openings, but on our corners, I always use a wet set bracket and I just cut one ear off. Um, I like the rebar going down, but using these on garage door openings works really well because you can just uh, fine tune where uh, your post is going to be. So those are the four uh, brackets that we use the most. Um, they make all kinds of brackets. They make a SWP 46, they make an SWP 88, pretty much any combination you want, uh, they have it. So just keep that in mind. We'll put all the uh, retail prices on these. Um, so you can kind of have an idea how much it's going to cost you. If you are interested in a quote, you can reach out to us. We can probably save you some money. All right, guys, that's going to be a wrap on this footing job. We got all the brackets set. Um, the only thing I have left to do is to put some straw down over this. It's going to be 60 today. It's going to stay above freezing tonight, but the following nights it's going to get below freezing. So I want this concrete to cure properly. So I'm going to cover it all with straw. So as it goes through in the curing process, it never drops below freezing. Um, but we'll leave a list of all the materials that we use to do this and a cost breakdown um, for peers, what it would cost you to do this on your own, including skid steer rental, auger rental, all that good stuff. Hopefully this cost breakdown will kind of give you an idea of what you're going to have in your peers at the end of the day for your specific build. So as always, we appreciate you guys watching. If you haven't already hit that subscribe button, share us with your friends, and we will catch you on the next video.